the presentation and let me start by introducing Terry. Terry is the managing director of Vernier Hydro, a French manufacturer of drinking water supply technologies for developing countries, particularly in isolated areas. In fact, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Vernier hand pump. Since its founding in 1976, Vernier Hydro has been involved in maintenance systems for its equipment based on establishing networks of local repair persons and spare parts supply chains. Terry joined Vernier Hydro in 2004. Previously, he worked for 18 years in a consulting firm specialized in water and environment, where he headed the International Development Department. Terry has 10 years of experience on issues related to the sustainability of rural and small town pipe schemes, principally in Africa. Terry received his degree in hydro geology from the Ecole de Géologie de Nancy, France. So Terry, I will now hand the microphone over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I hope you can uh, hear me. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I don't know. I saw everybody. Uh, a lot of people are connected all around the world. That's terrific. Uh, thank you all for being here. So let's go straight to the presentation. Uh, just a few words very quickly on Vernier to complete what Elizabeth just said. So Vernier is a French group working in three different areas. The wind, the energy, solar energy and water. Water being the historical activity of the group. We are a manual pump manufacturer and also water tank manufacturer. So the, the, the common links of the three activities is that we are aiming to provide services in isolated zones, whether for energy or water. Uh, concentrating on the water branch, we've been in the business for more than 30 years and uh, we are considering ourselves as a stakeholder, not only a simple manufacturer of uh, manual pumps, and we are trying to develop a lot of uh, systems for sustainability of the hand pumps and also for the small pipe systems. We've installed so far about 100,000 pumps and about 200 tanks. Uh, as you can see on the next slide, we are mainly African. We are also a bit in Asia where we start uh, a new activity and a bit also in Latin America. The, the, what we do is every time we work in a country, we either work through a subsidiary, we have three, Niger, Burkina and Cote d'Ivoire, or through a, a partner, a local company who is our partner. They, this company is in charge of installation of the equipment, but also of the after sales service of the equipment. This is uh, very important for sustainability. Let's go into the the real subject now. As you can see on, this ma on these maps, the situation is dramatic in terms of uh, water coverage in Africa. You can see that urban area is much more covered, I would say, with potable water than rural areas. And uh, uh, in addition to that, we can say that all the figures used to make this statistic are considering that everything which is on site, on the field, is operating, which is not true. We know very well that at an average about 50 percent of uh, manual pump or even small pipe system are unfortunately not working after one or two years. And uh, this is really, really terrific because at that today at least half of the population or maybe more than half of the population is still in these rural areas uh, and not concentrated uh, sometimes as it is said in urban areas. When we move forward you, we realize that the investment in urban area have uh, have gone up slowly since the beginning of uh, 2000s. And in rural area, it did, did not go, I mean, the, the, the trend is not as much as in urban areas, except in 2009. But when you look in detail at 2009, 
you realize that it's the next the, the, the right uh, bar chart you realize that most of the investment went to Asia and Africa remain at the same value so Africa is today the continent which is most suffering from uh, lack of potable water in rural areas and apparently there is not real uh, there is not sufficient investment made in that country compared to the requirements which have to be met and uh, why the question is why why are we facing this situation and uh, our experience and uh, our uh, uh, knowledge of Africa and of the rural areas and of the donors and the government seems that an efficiency of the investment which most of the time after two years are uh, not working anymore the equipment finance put in place are not fi are not working are not, are not operating after two years and this seems to be a real problem I mean it does not encourage the governments and the donors to put more money in rural areas because it's it seems like to be a real waste and if according to the, if compared to that we we want to face and to meet the MDG the Millennium Development Goals then uh, we realize that it's between bracket easier to invest in Africa in an urban uh, area than in rural areas is cheaper and faster to 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 meet a, a big a, a real coverage of potable water than in rural areas and at the end of the day statistics are made for water as a whole you don't have any distinction between urban and rural so I mean the 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 the, the, the dramatic situation of rural area disappears in the global statistics of water so what we would like to insist on is that there are countries of course I, I'm not going to take into as an example all the country but I've taken three countries where things systems are working even in rural areas and after long period and uh, it seems to us to be interesting to look at those specific countries to know to understand why they have succeeded in making systems in rural areas sustainable and where to see whether it's applicable to other countries so I've taken into uh, into consideration Guinea and Chad for manual pump and Burkina Faso for small pipe system if you look at Guinea and Chad they are key factor in their water policy which are standardization and zoning of the pumps the pump brands and the fact that for every village with less than 2,000 people we use manual pump we are not going to look for other technology because and we shall see it later but we know that people cannot afford it Concerning Burkina Faso, they were suffering from a very low operat operating rate of their small pipe system. And they decided a few years ago to change their policy and to try to involve the private sector in this small water market uh, of uh, small pipe system. And they do everything in order, they did everything in order to attract doing the, the private sector let's look at the results Guinea of course I'm talking about the the average situation of the country uh, not th there may be some specific areas where you will not meet this uh, uh, operational uh, rate of the pumps but at an average you have something like 85 percent of the pump working and even with pump aging more than 15 years and in Chad it's closer to 90 percent so in Burkina the in involvement of the private operator right from the start in the uh, design the construction and the operation of the small system gave confidence to 
the uh, beneficiaries and also to the private operator. And you can see that there is a real win-win cooperation where, uh, and the, the, mo the, the, the best proof is the increase of the specific consumption. People are consuming more and more water and are paying for this water throughout the months and the years. So we chose that there is a, uh, uh, they have adopted the system and the management of uh, the, 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 the water service which is made by the private operator. Now, what are the main results and lessons, and lessons sorry, of these three countries? What has been done? I think, first of all, it was a clear rural water supply policy, and I insist on the rural water supply policy, not a water policy. And uh, this rural water supply policy allowed to set a foundation for designing, defining a, a very favorable environment for the private operators to feel safe and understand what we are expecting from them and to make them to be involved in that sector. Based on that, if you can, through a, a policy, offer a vision to the private operator, of course, he will change his position. He will not react as a project-based strategy, he will not respond to call for tender only, he will project himself in a new approach which will be a market-based strategy. This approach will be, of course, initiated by the project, but after it will become uh, something like uh, uh, recurrent. I mean, it will be, the, the market will come every year and every year. And the other point which is very interesting for, by the involvement of the private sector is that in uh, the local economy you can create some small job around the water point in order to guarantee the service but also to create some local economy that will help people to stay where they are instead of moving. And all this is uh, acting the same way to guarantee sustainability as much as possible. So if we would like to summarize, we need to give confidence to the government and the donors that the money they will put in the rural water supply sector will not be wasted. And uh, what that, on that, what the, the, you will take into account the sustainability aspect of the investment. That is really very important. You cannot, you if you want to to attract investment, you have to. It should be a win-win uh, cooperation. So you have to offer some guarantee, especially in terms of sustainability. And what are uh, for me? There are four types of actions to be taken. Political first, like I said, it was done in these three countries I mentioned. There should be a real policy giving a vision to the private sector for the future. That is one point. In this policy, things should be clearly defined that you should meet the requirement, the financial capacities of the user. So there should be the the, the, the there should be an adequacy between the the offer that you will make for the people and what they can afford. Standardization of the technology is also helping the private sector to clarify his market. And one of the most important thing is to work with the manufacturers rather than with uh, intermediaries because. Uh, the, the, the manufacturers, they have good reason to become involved in the long-term operation of the product. But the intermediaries uh, may, uh, profit from opportunities and generally have no real desire for long-term commitment. And for sustainability, you need long-term commitment. In terms of technical action, uh, I mentioned Vlom, but Vlom in terms of 
easiness to access the pump. It should be easy to repair the pump. Uh, that is, I mean, it should be easy to repair the technology being used. Uh, then there should be an adequacy between equipment and context, which means if you want to install a pump at 80 or 90 meters deep because the water table is so deep, you buy the, the required product which exists. You don't try to modify the, the one that you have trying to, 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 to reinvent something which will not work on a long-term basis by all means. The other important thing is to secure the water resource, especially in terms of boreholes. When you drill boreholes, more and more technology, especially uh, what we call uh, hand-dug boreholes, this is good in certain geological context, but even when a borehole is made manually, you should respect the, the, the fundamental rules of art and uh, make sure that the, the water which is going to be pumped out is clean and uh, well uh, protected. In terms of management, once again, involve the manufacturer in the maintenance of the equipment, not only the retailers. The retailers are depending on the manufacturers, so the importance of the role to be played by the manufacturers is very, very, very important. And the maintenance locally should be interest to the private sector, to the local private sector, who are who is a partner of the manufacturer. and in terms of small pipe, this local manufacturer could be involved in the construction of the work. So after he can be sure that he knows what he's going to take uh, in management. Uh, for the uh, water service, of course, it has to be sold. People have to pay for the water service. That is why it's very important to uh, make to, to be careful with, between, with the adequation between the technology and what the people can afford. Last point, the economic action, very also very important. We, I know that this is something which, is, which starts coming out, with, but uh, prefer long-term low maintenance costs to low investment costs. Take into account the cost of the investment plus the cost of the maintenance on a long-term basis 10, 15, 20 years, what we call life cycle costing approach. If we only look at the cost on, on, of the investment, we shall have problem because sometimes it's cheap at the investment, but it's quite expensive to maintain and the one who is maintaining the pump is the beneficiary. So we have to make sure that they can afford the amount that they will have to pay in the, in the future to maintain the system. If not, it's lost right from the start. We, it's, a, it's a dead end. To help the, 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 the beneficiary, uh, that will be uh, good to maybe try to have some exemption rules in some governments uh, that will be interesting to have VAT relief or zero import tariff for spare parts for a rural system. I know in some countries it does exist, maybe it could be generalized. And um, the last point which is more philosophical but also uh, important is that there is a lot of, I mean, th there is an explosion of financial costs for the government uh, relating to exodus of rural population to, towards large urban centers. And uh, it would be interesting to think about the potential economies which could be made by financing the rural sector because it will save a lot of money in rural areas. That's it. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and I, I hope uh, now we can exchange on these uh, different uh, matters. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Terry. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of our discussants because there's so many interesting points that, um, that I would like to follow up. But let me also thank you for giving such a good uh, uh, build up to some future webinars we have because we will have one on life cycle costing and we'll also have 
one on sustainable groundwater development. So everybody should stay tuned for that. And by the way, we have now reached 80 participants, which is the largest number we've ever had in this. Without further ado, let me introduce you all to Alex Bacallian. Alex is cur currently the acting manager of the bank unit, which lends for water supply in Africa. Alex first started working for the bank in 1986 and then became a full-time staff member in 1999. He's a bit unusual in that he has held positions in the bank both as a water supply specialist and as a water resources specialist. I guess it is his broad educational background that has, has allowed him to cover the uh, water sector so completely. Alex has degrees in civil engineering, environmental engineering, and business administration. Let me mention just a couple of things from Alex's long and distinguished career here at the bank, the ones that are, are perhaps most germane to water, rural water supply. Alex was the task manager who prepared a bank rural water supply project in Paraguay that tested build and operate contracts as an alternative to traditional community management. This uh, project is so often cited in uh, the literature, um, even to this day. Alex also conducted a major study of post-construction support to rural water supply systems from 2004 to 2009. Finally, he is in many ways responsible for this webinar series. When Alex attended the RWSN forum last year, he recognized what an important source of knowledge and expertise on rural water supply had been gathered in Kampala and how important it was for the bank to connect with this body of knowledge. And that, indeed, is the origin of this webinar series. So Alex, I now turn the microphone over to you. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. This is very interesting, very good uh, introduction. I appreciate your kind words. Uh, thank you for also participating. Uh, after this introduction, I feel like I have to make a major uh, presentation, but I have only a few comments that I've been sort of uh, reflecting on since I've been reflecting on this uh, presentation and also in general about rural water supply in, uh, in our work, basically. Uh, I mean, as, as Thierry was mentioning, the issue of sustainability has been I mean, sort of in our minds for past, I don't know how many decades, I think everybody talks about the lack of functionality in many of the systems that we built. Uh, we return to many of these projects and we find that uh, many of the systems are not functioning. But there are also many countries that have done something different and have been able to sort of maybe overcome these issues. And I think the, the countries that were mentioned in this presentation, uh, by the, uh, the three countries, Chad, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, maybe they are sort of the outliers. I'm not familiar in, in detail about these three countries except for, for Burkina, except for Burkina, which I visited. But I understand there are, each country has done it a little bit differently. So I think the trick for us is to understand what are the political and sort of the cultural differences that you might find in different countries, which make certain places work, so certain countries perform better, have better results than other countries. I think that we've, we've been trying to figure out this sort of almost like a, trying to find out a formula in a way which makes uh, everybody perform the same level, but I think we have been, we should say that we haven't really succeeded into that. In the 90s, we've been uh, sort of, we, we hit or we sort of stumbled onto this idea of the demand responsive, which was almost like a, uh, uh, ideological, if you want to say it, if, uh, in a way that sort of uh, we reflected the, the fact that we need to go to bottom up to development and everybody sort of jumped on the bandwagon. And even that, I think we are coming to realize that it is not a panacea. We are not sort of really found the final sort of answer how rural water supply should be done. We are still trying to find why in certain places where this approach has been apl applied and we still haven't really uh, f uh, succeeded in, in, in reaching sustainability. Now, there are two issues, obviously, sustainability is one, and then also financing of the sector is another. And to what extent we are really directing enough funds to the sector is a big issue. I think the MDGs have pushed us a little bit to get to that uh, sort of to, to increase our investments, but yet still I mean, everybody knows that we're not going to reach in a large, in many countries the MDGs are far, far behind the targets that have been set. I think we have uh, a long way to go on the, on the coverage side also. I think that's a financing sector, financing issue on the sector. Uh, 
as important as it is, I think we're still sort of trying to, I mean, there is a lot of resistance putting more money when we're not sure that the sustainability can be guaranteed. I think my main, main point is that, I mean, I agree with all the points that were made by Thierry. I think there are, there are factors that are where we know they have an influence on that, but I think we have not really were able to gauge to what in which in which country what factors make more difference. I mean, there are issues of pricing, of management, whether it's community or versus a private operator. And what's the role of the government? I mean, what's the role of regulation? Uh, and then certain countries, in certain cases, actually, in some villages, you might have alternative sources that might impact uh, use, uh, the use or the sustainability of of a new investment. I think we are trying to really uh, culture continuously uh, finding what is the, the the balance of what what factors make make things work. I think my, my conclusion is that this is basically each country is different and we should look at the evidence in each country. We should not go in one size fits. I mean, there's no, I mean, we've been maybe guilty in, in the last few years to continuously or, or insist too much on the demand responsiveness maybe of a uh, concept of the bottom up, which works in many places. I'm not, uh, there's no, no, no issue about that. But I think it should not be the only solution that we have, that should have applied. I think uh, we should look at the evidence. We should build evidence in many countries. I think, in, and I think it's very important to understand that different countries function differently and the evidence is usually very complex. There is, uh, I mean, uh, the culture, the political economy, the practices, the old sort of time, time bound, time honored practices, all of these things are difficult to evaluate and difficult to assess and, and yet these are the factors that make a big difference in the success, in the success or the failure of a system. I think these are my comments at this point. I mean, I'm really learning as we all are at the same time trying to find sort of the, the, the optimum, optimum solutions, but maybe we're probably looking for something that doesn't exist. I think we should go to basics and then look at solutions country by country and build on existing knowledge, existing evidence. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Alex. Let me now uh, quickly turn to uh, Tom Roberts and give a brief introduction to him. Tom is a water resources engineer with 25 years experience in various aspects of water development, water supply and sewage collection, treatment and disposal. For the African Development Bank, where he has been since 2004, he has been directly responsible for water and sanitation projects in major capital cities and rural areas in seven African countries, in addition to managing several studies. Prior to joining the African Development Bank, he worked in Canada and elsewhere for engineering consulting firms. Tom was a founding partner of two cooperatives, one providing municipal engineering services and the other providing reforestation services. He has worked in Africa for some 15 years. Tom, I now turn the microphone over to you. Tom, by the way, is sitting in Kenya, I believe in Nairobi. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, <clears throat> for that introduction and uh, I wanted to start simply by thanking Thierry uh, at this point for uh, his commitment to the uh, rural areas of Africa and providing water to those areas. There are not uh, many examples uh, of his nature of firms which have done such a, a wide, uh, covered such a wide area in Africa in the rural areas uh, so persistently. So that doesn't go unrecognized and we hope your commitment continues into the future and that others join you in that commitment. Uh, in uh, my comments to this uh, topic, I was, uh, uh, you know, the, the actions uh, to attract investment to rural water supply uh, being the title. We recently had an experience in Marseille at the Sixth World Water Forum, the African Development Bank, with the assistance of some uh, stakeholders, uh, namely uh, ex-IMF director Mr. Michel Tembisou, who was a, a really great support and a real supporter for rural water supply and sanitation in Africa. Uh, we were raising funds and uh, the, I, I bring this up at this point uh, based on the, the content of the title uh, because we're trying also to uh, increase the resources made to the rural subsector in Africa. And, the point that Mr. Kambisu made to our president and which he accepted, which it was a little bit hard for uh, some uh, uh, people in our bank to accept this concept, I think, uh, but it, it turned out to be the correct concept uh, because it yielded fruit. And the concept was uh, taking this uh, concept of demand driven from the project level 
to the high resource mobilization level, uh, and a point which probably seems uh, fairly uh, simple to digest, but when you actually try to put it in practice, uh, is a little bit more challenging. And uh, what it led to was Mr. Cambusu writing to the ministers of finance uh, across the continent and to many other high-level uh, people, even heads of state, uh, requesting them to consider this rural water initiative of the African Development Bank uh, and to fund it. And uh, uh, the point he was making was that when the African governments step forward and provide the resources, and many of them are, are, are already doing so, but when they show what they're providing, then that really uh, leverages significant resources from outside the continent. Just for statistical purposes, this conference uh, in, uh, on the 14th of March and a little bit after, we, we had some uh, uh, commitments after, there was 116 uh, million USD uh, committed to, uh, well, not only to the Rural Water Trust Fund, but to also the African Water Facility, uh, but the bulk of it going to the Rural Water Trust Fund. And of those resources, 17% uh, of it came from African governments. And uh, there were a total of eight uh, commitments, five African and three uh, non-African. So uh, that's one example of, uh, uh, I think, a way in which uh, we can push to get more resources to the subsector. Uh, however, as the content of this uh, seminar also brings out, it is required also to make sure that these systems are sustainable. And it's not only, in my experience at the African Development Bank in the last eight years, it's not only the donors outside who want to see sustainability, but when these African governments start putting their money into it uh, more vociferously, uh, they will watch much more closely the sustainability aspects. Uh, the, I guess the second comment I wanted to make was regarding the, the rural populations themselves vis-a-vis -vis sustainability. And I made this comment in the Rural Water uh, Supply Network annual meeting in Kampala last December, but it relates to the way in which we perceive the people that are you know, to, to be receiving the water services. And uh, it, it's how do we perceive them and how do we bring them into this, uh, into these projects, so that uh, they don't see them as a project uh, of someone else. They see them as their own projects, and that I think is one of the uh, paradigm shifts that uh, we need to be able to uh, gradually, over time. It's not something that I think can happen slowly, uh, quickly, but over time, I think uh, this type of a shift needs to take place. And uh, you know, we, we need to see them rather than simply recipients of benefits from aid and training, rather than simply a group of people without resources, uh, you know, no health care, no education, uh, to look at them rather from the point of view that they can make a water supply and sanitation project much more sustainable if we can find what resources and we can bring them into the, the dialogue and the planning at the upstream stages as much as possible and throughout the implementation period. And uh, you know, when the uh, we have trust funds in our institutions in uh, African Development Bank and the World Bank also, and these trust funds uh, can be used to, for example, they, they, I mean, in, in the two institutions, they cannot be used for uh, doing implementation or for other activities which would normally be funded uh, through a loan or a grant to those countries under their the, the financing that the governments receive from these institutions uh, from their main financing windows, but they can support, for example, some pilot testing activities, which could then be scaled up during the implementation phase. And one example would be the strengthening of the, the uh, consultative processes within the country and trying to have a, a deeper level of, of consultation with the communities. Uh, and uh, my experience in uh, Uganda in 1994, uh, in South Africa a couple of years later, Communities, probably others uh, can bear this out, but communities typically are ready to contribute resources. Uh, the problem is that the uh, that I experienced in uh, these two countries was the delay in the institutions, the financial institutions and the government institutions, living up to their commitments. The communities were much quicker in showing their readiness. In fact, uh, anyway, I have a couple of other examples of the same nature, but I, I won't go into them all. Uh, the uh, uh, way in which we, one way to get closer to communities to make systems more sustainable, and I say sustainable because uh, I'm thinking not only in terms of uh, private sector 
uh, operation and maintenance of the systems, uh, but also public sector, both of them. It, the, the concepts I, I'm saying would apply to both of these two uh, types of uh, uh, management uh, and implementation. And that is to try to get closer to the community. And the civil works contractor generally has a, uh, uh, you know, he, he realizes his own vested interest to get as close as he can to the community, but sometimes he's constrained. And one way uh, that we found to help them is to have a nominated subcontractor as in the civil works contract uh, and nominating that subcontractor in advance uh, and that subcontractor being a, an NGO that's recognized and effective and able to, for example, mobilize the community. So then that part is built in the contractor. That's a big risk on his side. And if that can be removed, then he, he can uh, go ahead much uh, more smoothly. Uh, that again related to the uh, development of a network of NGOs within a country that, that could be a pool that could be uh, chosen from when development of uh, tender documents. Um, <clears throat> the fact that the money uh, not being wasted and we need to consider more sustainability, uh, I think the, yeah, I, I made that comment uh, earlier that that's what the uh, donors really focus on, but the more that we can get the governments uh, uh, showing leadership in the financing of systems and I mean, I, a lot of them do it, and uh, there was a recent World Bank study which showed a significant uh, amount of government uh, contribution to um, uh, rural water, the water sector in general, rather. Uh, the Africa Knowledge Infrastructure Project did show that. Uh, but th th that was like a small line in a, in, a, in, a, in a box. These things need to be headlines. And that puts the governments in the limelight, and then they become more committed and more responsible, and they respond uh, appropriately. Um, uh, the fact of getting the uh, manufacturers involved, as Thierry mentioned, I think is a very important point. Thierry, maybe you might have some way to propose to the IFIs and others how you would propose that could be done. Uh, I think I've probably used up my five minutes or more. Uh, let me pass the mic back uh, to the moderator. Um, thank you very much, Tom, and, and to both of you, to Alex and to Tom. Um, we're fortunate that both our presenter and our discussants today made um, brief remarks, so we have more time for questions and answers, which is the fun part, I think, for most of you in the, in the audience. So we'll now pass to our question and answer segment, and you can st some people have already started doing this, so please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Um, unfortunately, we know from experience that we can all get to a small portion of the questions. We have Agnes, Kirsten, and possibly Sean. I think Sean might have stepped away um, for a moment. But they're working behind the scenes to keep an orderly list of all of your questions. And Sujung, could I ask you now to bring out the, uh, the question pod? What we're going to do is have uh, Kirsten read out one question or a comment at a time. And Kirsten, if a, a question or a comment is met for Alex or Tom specifically, could you please tell them that before uh, reading the question? So uh, I now turn the mic over to you, Kirsten. Thanks, Elizabeth. Can you hear me clearly, or is it my microphone OK? Great. Uh, yeah, Thanks. I can hear you just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a, a kind of a little bit of discussion that's been going on between Gordon Mumbo in Kenya and Bongi Maposa. Um, it's particularly to Thierry. Um, the question is, users in most cases, they don't actually know the pump manufacturers. In fact, most projects are done by external agencies who fail to link with the, pan the manufacturers of pumps. So that when pumps are being imported, and mostly pumps are imported into a country, it becomes very difficult um, to have the link between the manufacturer and the, 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 the users. And, and how can the, the challenge is how to invest more time in examining the beneficiary communities and creating the linkages between them and the service providers? Particularly to, to Thierry, because you're not the only pump manufacturer in countries. There are many others from India. So how to get that link between the manufacturer and the user? Thanks. Over to you. Thank you. I think uh, it's quite easy to make. Is When you call for tender, 
you just specify in the terms of reference that you should be a manufacturer to be allowed to bid for the the pump uh, for the the, the the proposal and uh, of course if it's not only that condition which should appear it's also that you should be the manufacturer you should be ready to invest in an after sales service you should be uh, ready to have a local partner who will be in charge of importing the parts throughout the time you will be you will have this local man, uh, partner who will be in charge of distributing the parts throughout the country where the pumps will be installed in order to be as close as possible from the users I refer to what I said in, in my presentation it's a matter of political willingness in this should be a decision made by the country that to make sure that what we do today will still be working in certain number of years 10 15 20 30 years I don't know why not there should there are some condition to, to respond a bit to what Alex said I agree that we cannot do everything everywhere with the same results this I agree totally but I know with all the experience we have that you have in the World Bank that Tom has in the African Development Bank that NGOs have government have we know what we should not do we may not know what exactly what we should do but we know what we should not do and sometimes we continue doing we continue doing that because we we have no idea of we, we don't it's difficult to change so I, I think that it should come from the governments maybe pushed by the donor that in the terms of reference there are some conditions to respect to make sure that we, we tend towards sustainability I hope I have understood I have responded to the question so I, I, I uh, I'm thanks Thierry let me come to the next question um, it's around collaboration and, and does Vernier work with other NGOs or with other private companies particularly in country and it would be nice to have some really specific examples of what you're doing and how you're doing it thanks microphone uh, we do work with NGOs we do work uh, for instance with uh, World Vision in several countries Chad uh, Guinea uh, Niger sorry uh, Mali, we do work with Plan in Burkina Faso or in Togo, we do work with Concern in uh, DRC or in uh, Burundi, I mean we have we are Solidarité with a uh, French NGO in other countries, we, we do work a lot with NGOs but this, we, the, our way of working is not always the same, sometimes we sell the, the pumps to NGOs and they take care of the, the the project I mean the, the installation of pump or whatever but we commit ourselves to supply the pumps to identify uh, uh, a local partner to ident to to link with him for the uh, after sales service the training of uh, local people so even if we work for NGOs or with private companies like drilling companies sometimes you have call for tender for boreholes and pumps and it's the drilling company who is responding so we team up with the drilling company but it, we, it, it does not impede us to do our job in terms of installation of an after sales service through a local partner this is something we do uh, systematically over Thank you very much. My next question comes from Ethiopia. Um, I think maybe also to you and, and to the other two actually, it would be nice to hear from all three of you from our discussants um, very briefly. What would be your comment on, on the way forward for some countries who put rural water supply as the only responsibility of government and especially on action that should be taken by international organizations to convince more involvement of the private sector and why is this presentation limited to VLOM if more private sector involvement is needed? Over to you, start with 
Okay, I take the lead in terms of uh, Jerry. Okay, I take the lead in terms of response. Uh, rural water supply the only responsibility of the government. I would say this if I look at what happened in France at the beginning of the last century. That is exactly what happened. I mean, it was the government was in charge of supplying the rural community to pay for the investment. Then it was the responsibility of the communes who, have, who had the, the possibility to delegate the service to take care of the maintenance. But the initial investment was supported by the government, 100%. Concerning Vlom, why? Well, I, I mentioned during my presentation Vlom in terms of easiness to uh, repair the pump because for remote areas if you start needing heavy equipment to come and repair the pump it will be very expensive and people will not be able to afford it so most of the private sector does not mean that it should you 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 can have heavy equipment you can have a local private sector private repairman who can easily repair the pump without not too much equipment and this is easier for the population and mainly cheaper for them to have their pump repaired. So I, I, I give the, the mic to Alex or uh, Tom. Would either of you, um, Alex or Tom, would either of you like to say something? Um, if not, this is Alex, I think, uh, yeah. No, I raise my hand. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> You haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is a good question. I think the, 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 I mean, the answer would be, from my, from my perspective, that I mean, international organizations and governments should discuss uh, the options that exist in the country. I mean, there's no reason to believe that only government can provide service, especially if the, the, the facts on the ground are not supporting the sustainability targets that we all have. I mean, if there are things that have not done well in the past, based on a model that has been, a pro has been utilized, there is no reason why not to discuss the option of private private sector. I think that's how things are always are sort of uh, are, uh, considered. I mean, we move from one model to the other because the previous model didn't seem to happen. It almost seems like a generic or not generic, or is it, it's an organic way of developing what are the, the next logical uh, option. I think we, in every country, they have to go through this uh, testing and learning by doing phase, which uh, seems like the natural way of uh, improving on an existing model. We should not just repeat the same mistakes, obviously. So I don't see any reason why not to bring the private sector model to Ethiopia, for example, if the current model seems to have uh, run its uh, its course in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm not discarding government's role in this, but I think there may be a role for private sector. So I think we all have to figure this out together. Uh, Donors and uh, NGOs and and one has done has experience on the ground. I think that's uh, the the combination of all these experiences that's going to lead us forward. So I think that's my view on this. Uh, okay, maybe I can make a brief comment. Uh, I I think what I understand from the question is uh, that governments are doing, in particular, perhaps we're talking about Ethiopia, but perhaps uh, we're not, uh, we're talking about several other governments as well, uh, they're, they're doing uh, quite a bit in the rural subsector, uh, but it, perhaps there is a need uh, to better communicate what is being done, what government is doing, uh, in terms of making the message a bit more uh, uh, sophisticated to to the outside uh, donors uh, because uh, the Africa Infrastructure Country Diagnostic Study did indicate uh, a significant amount of finance into the water sector by, Afri by, by uh, developing country governments. I can't recall if it was just African or if it was all of them, but I think it was all of them. And uh, But the message uh, doesn't seem to be getting out. Uh, now then the other aspect of what was international organizations uh, well, what should they do to promote this? Um, I think, in some respects, their hands are a little bit tied. Uh, you know, there's a, there are processes by which they dialogue with government to plan the forward-looking three to five-year period in the PRSP or in ADB's case with the 
uh, South African Development Bank with the country strategy papers. Uh, and the dialogue process goes on, and that's where uh, you know the, the sectors to be prioritized in the future are identified, and then the resources from the institution are directed in those sectors. However, there's also, as we've seen in North Africa and in uh, other parts of the world, there's the significantly and probably most influential voice from the countries themselves of uh, the, the, the average person on the street. When these people are mobilized, they have uh, significant power to push their governments in certain directions. And uh, so uh, I think that's a message that needs to get out as well, that uh, you know, countries can do a lot uh, at their level. And you know, it, with, the, with the right ingredients, um, you know, such as uh, mobilizing leaders of public opinion and mobilizing the press, uh, especially at the critical times of re-elections, uh, you know, a lot can be done to strengthen the, the resources and the commitment of government and others as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions here around local demand for, for you, Thierry. Um, much of the discussion seems to revolve around the supply side issues. And we would like to know what's being done on the demand side of the equation. And that's a related question is, do we need a paradigm shift from a world and global view of water supply and sanitation to a very local one? And water supply, in my opinion, is something very local, having to consider communities and local natural situations. Over to you, Kerry. Thank you. Uh, concerning the first question, I think we, we have to look at the demand side of the equation by saying what do the people want? They don't want a pump, they don't want a borehole, they don't want whatever. They want water. They want potable water. And it's up to the government, the donors, I mean the, the people uh, who are involved, the stakeholders, to design what is the best affordable solution for them to guarantee the water service on a long-term basis. And uh, what was done in, in the countries that my, I mentioned, Guinea and Burkina, was below 2,000, we can, the peop, we, we, you can make all the calculation you want. If you do it on a long-term basis, they cannot afford more than a manual pump on a borehole. So government pay the investment and people take care of the maintenance. And that's where the private sector comes in. It's to help them to... Uh, make sure that the system will be working on a long-term basis. So, for me, to, to speak about um, pump, which have a pump, solar pump, hand pump, or whatever, is not the to, to, is not the idea of supply side solution. We are all talking about demand side of the of the, uh, of demand side demand demand approach, which is we want potable water on a reliable affordable way. That's for me the, the real issue. Uh, now the second question, uh, of course every situation is, I would say, uh, especially in terms of groundwater, is very specific according to the, 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 the situation, the local natural situation and the, the, the communities or Alex said it, the, the, the habits, the traditions and whatever, but uh, these have to be, these issues have to be addressed during the implementation, but not at the stage of the design and at the stage of the, the, the where we are, we are choosing the, the solution to make sure that we can supply water on a long-term basis. I don't know if I, if my reply is satisfactory, but uh, the second solution was, uh, the second question was not very clear to me, sorry. I think I think that's quite clear, actually. Thank you. I'm going to move on just to kind of slowly get through the, these questions. Um, the next question is really around the local private sector and location of manufacture. And I've got three linked questions here from the participants. Um, are your pumps manufactured locally? And um, from Kevin Jones, they've been looking at expanding assembly in countries, but they're really struggling with local support for that assembly, of pump assembly. And a point from Gordon Mumbo, which 
those of us working in the sector for a while know is that many local manufacturers in countries went out of business. And, and why is that? And are there things that we could learn from that to improve the sustainability? Over to you. OK. Uh, once, uh, that's a very important question. And uh, I agree with you. Why are not we, we, are, uh, are we not able to manufacture uh, manual pump locally. No, we can say it's a simple technology, it's an old technology, and today still most of the pumps are imported. At least in Africa they are imported from Europe or from, from India. Why? I, we tried on our side to manufacture at least part of the pump locally, which is, and we are still doing it in uh, several countries, we manufacture part of the pump. But to manufacture the, 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 all the pumps is very difficult because the, the industrial uh, uh, network in Africa is not so developed. So you, it means that in one country you will have to manufacture one part because they have the technology for that. In another country you will manufacture another one. In another country you will manufacture another one. Then you will have to bring all the parts somewhere to assemble the pump. And then you will have to uh, sell the pump to the different customer. And don't forget that, and that's the real issue in fact, that when you are on a uh, project or uh, ex uh, external agency financing uh, project, you are tax free. You can import without tax all the goods. If you manufacture locally and you import the raw material, the raw material, you pay all the taxes. You move from a country to another with the parts to get the, the pump assembled, you pay taxes. And at the end of the day, it's much more expensive for a manufacturer like us to manufacture locally than to manufacture in Europe and to import. And I agree with you, this is a real issue. But so far, I have not found the way to make something of equal quality simply and uh, at a lower cost that, than what I do in the, the, the plant in Europe. Uh, and uh, that's responding to the third question. If you manufacture locally, you, you go out of business because there is also a matter of quality issue. You have a quality control which is very difficult to uh, to to do because you manufacture sometimes most of the part in several countries like I said and it becomes very difficult, very, very expensive. So at the end of the day economically it's not worth it. So that is why mod, m most of the local manufacturers have disappeared in Africa. Thank you so very I much. I, uh, I have a Okay, uh, I have another question here about learning and evidence, and this also relates to the point that was made by Alex in his presentation. So let me just put it up on the screen. Um, on Friday, it's the Sanitation and Water for All high-level meeting at the bank, and how do we make sure that the learning on private sector participation is actually shared at that meeting? How do we get that information to that high level? And let me put that question to you, Thierry. Um, thank you. I'm not sure I'm the, the best to, <laughs> to respond to this question. Maybe Alex <laughs> will be in a better position okay. because he will be at the World Bank. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, let me answer. I, mean, I can try to answer because I don't have a good answer for it. I, I, actually, I will be there. I will be one of the facilitators. We have many facilitators that uh, will help the ministers discuss the issues that they have. And I'll be, I think there are six or seven uh, groups that will be discussing uh, the, the final statement that is going to come out at the end of this uh, meeting, which we put forward for the finance ministers. I think the meeting is, is designed in the first days, the water ministers will prepare and discuss the issues and then come up with a statement which will be put forward the next day 
to the finance ministers the next afternoon, actually. So there will be discussion between finance ministers and water ministers. So there will be opportunities for, to bring this up, I think, in the small groups that I will be certainly participating in. I will have a, an opportunity probably to brief certain ministers to make it just a little bit uh, to the broader audience rather than just the group that I'll be working with. And hopefully this will come up in the next day. I think this is an issue that, I mean, again, it should not be seen as a as a line of ideological line, but I think it's something that we should all sort of be aware that it has worked in some places and can work in other places. And I think it's a we need to pursue this idea of not only the participation of the private sector in management of the system, but I think uh, we should push further even in terms of trying to figure out whether they can bring finance into the sector also. I think it's only if we can break that that sort of ceiling, if I can call it that way, is that we're going to be able to increase the coverage rates, I think, in the sector. Otherwise, we'll be continuing the same way that we have done, plus or minus, whether depending on the donors and the, the development partners, NGOs. But unless we really break that and see how we can add uh, private sector money to our subsector, I think it's going to be a a long way before we get to to reach any significant increase in targets. Back to you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much for that, and have a good meeting. I know you have to leave, but thank you very much for joining the the the, the, um, the webinar as a discussant. Thank you. Um, the next question again for Thierry um, from Rafael from Bolivia, who's posted this question twice. So thanks very much, Rafael, for making sure we don't lose your question. No doubt that hand pumps would be one of the best technologies for rural dispersed communities in um, low Latin American countries, and that they would not be included in the MDG deadline. I think there's an issue about um, whether these pumps count towards MDG targets or not. Um, and, but how to build an enabling environment for the private sector in these countries where private sector participation is banned in the water sector such as Bolivia and Nicaragua? Should we just wait for the private sector or should they be invited and should something be done proactively? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Difficult. I mean, like I said, it's a matter of political willingness. If in the country, in a country, there is a real willingness not to involve the private sector in the water sector for any reason, it's very difficult for the private sector himself to fight for being involved. Because, like I said, it's a, it should be a win-win discussion in Burkina it was not so easy to define, to design an environment suitable for the private sector to be involved. I mean, of course, sometimes the, the governments, the community, they fear the private sector. They, 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 they have, there is a matter of, uh, are we going to, can we trust them? Are, are they not going to charge us too much and to, to chop all our money? But on the other hand, the private sector, before committing itself in, in the business needs to have a, a, a certain uh, conditions. I mean, uh, the, the vision, the security, the, the guarantee of the water resources, which does not depend on him, etc., etc. So it's very difficult for him to alone to, ha to assemble all the conditions if he does not have the support of the government. Let me come on for just a minute. Um, Tom Roberts, unfortunately, has to leave us. They're closing the office in Nairobi, and he has to go. So Tom, thank you very much for your participation. And um, uh, we will get the copy of all of the questions uh, to you as a Word document so that you can look over them. Uh, Kirsten, back to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I have a question here around technology type. Um, from Alan Watt. Um, in Senegal, we're trying to help local small entrepreneurs to make, install, and maintain rope pumps. These pumps are good for a small number of families, but they can't stand up to the rigors of serving 50 families. Maybe you can tell us something about your experiences and reactions to this rope pump technology and how you see it fitting in um, into improving access to drinking water in Africa. 
Thank you. Uh, my, my position is very clear. When I install a pump, whichever pump, before before being with Vernier, I was with, a, like Elizabeth said, a consulting engineering firm, and, and I had the opportunity to work on several projects and install several technologies of pump. When I install a pump on a borehole, and I explain to the people that this will be good for them, it will sort out, I mean, it will solve some uh, water-related uh, disease uh, issues, it will give them some time because the water is closer, blah, blah, blah. I mean, all the uh, usual speech. The, the, the least I could do is drink the water from this pump in front of them, just to show them that what I'm saying is good for them, it's also good for me. For this type of technology, wrap pump, which is generally limited to shallow wells, shallow water, and uh, the condition, the hygiene condition are not good. I will not drink a pump from a well which is pumped by a rub pump. Not because it's a rub pump, because the technology for me is not safe. So, yes, you are right. This is good for uh, a, 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 a small number of, mem of family, but the problem is how to secure the, 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 the well, because generally it's a well, to make sure that even for a small number of families, the water which comes out of the pump is what we call potable water and anybody can drink it. The problem of the uh, transportation and storage is another problem which is common to all type of uh, manual pump. But the problem is here in that specific technology is that I'm not sure, I doubt that the pump, the water which comes out is uh, safe water. Back to you. Thank you very much, Thierry. I think we've kind of opened a whole new discussion around the whole issue of water safety, accessibility of it being close to the home, quantity of water, and perhaps now with this human rights to water and these so-called normative criteria, there's a whole question of how to balance between questions of safety and questions of accessibility. Certainly in some remote areas, there may be communities that value quantity of water first before thinking about safety. And I noticed an earlier question that was talking about water treatment, of, of actually improving the quality of water after it's been pumped. So a whole set of issues coming out there. Um, I'm going to put something up about spares now. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what your experience is about these spare parts. When are they needed? How are they got to communities? Um, back over to you, Thierry. The, the spare parts, like I say, we, have, we are working with a local partner, we import them, we sell the spare, if the price of the part is 100, we sell it to our uh, partner at 75, and he will resell it at 100 and make his uh, margin of 25 on the part. But of course, who pays? Is the beneficiaries, the villagers, who pay the pump that they need, who pay the part, sorry, that they need to repair the pump. If they don't know themselves, sometimes what we see is that the, 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 the repairman comes to the village, diagnose the, the breakdown, then knows exactly what he has to buy, goes to the uh, shop, buy the parts at 70, at uh, 80, I mean, 75 plus 12.5, so 87.5, and sell it 100. It means that the margin is split into two between the shop and the repairman, because he, he, he's made the, the job for the villagers. But if the village comes straight to the shop, the villagers, because they know which part they have to buy, they pay the same price, for them it's the same, it's just the margin which, go, which goes to the storekeeper instead of being split, uh, shared between the storekeeper and the repairman but it's the beneficiaries who pays for the parts all the time. They, that is what we call to pay the, 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 the water service. Back to you. I'll take over um, from Kirsten for a minute, give her voice a break. And good, this is a question from my good friend Emmanuel Nkrumah, although we've never met face to face, we know each other so well from the uh, internet. 
Um, so Emmanuel asks you, Terry, what you will consider as the key sustainability factor, tariff, governance, pump quality, what would you put first? Thank you. Uh, I will put first, as a, as a manufacturer, pump quality, of course, but <laughs> no, tariff, we know that, we know what tariff people are ready to pay in rural areas in Africa. It's quite common that we are around one dollar per cubic meter, which is something which is very uh, common in rural areas. Governance, of course, get back to the political willingness and who is in charge of what and what is clearly what should be clearly defined. But of course, the pump quality is also very important. And I will add pump quality and involvement of the manufacturer for availability of spare parts on a long-term basis. That is what is what is really, really, really important. Pump quality because even a very good pump will break down because if it is used, it will break down at a moment. So the best quality will lower the number of breakdown, but will not avoid them. So we, you also need to have spare parts availability regularly to make sure that when there is a breakdown, you can repair. Back to you. Thank you very much. I'm here with Elizabeth. We're trying to pick questions and post them across. There's so much discussion going on that it's a tricky task. So um, thanks for all of your patience. Really picking up on Joe Gom's point here. Um, let me just put up the question. On multiple use, and this is I'm sure something that you've come across where people are using water not just for drinking but for other uses, uses such as watering their animals for market gardens and really what do you think about bringing this idea of multiple use and Joe Gom's point is we need to break out of the idea of domestic water supply as a separate requirement this is the perspective of a health practitioner or a development worker but not a water user what's needed is a much more holistic approach which is, will, that will prove to be more sensible from the village perspective. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, Thierry. It's true that uh, in many African villages you have cattle and, uh, or maybe a bit of gardens and the, the water point is used for domestic use but also for the, the, the other uh, um, uses. Uh, how to take that into account is not easy because uh, it can be, I would say, a very small quantity of water apart from domestic use or sometime in according to the, we, we, I refer to what we, may, we were mentioning earlier on, the, geologic, the geographical situation, the tradition, the, the country or whatever, it can be a, a huge part. And in that case, of course, it's difficult to ask the the, the, the people or the, the, the cattle to pay for water. But what we realized is generally when you have a lot of cattle, you 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 dig wells to supply water for the, the, the cattle and the, for the gardens. And you keep on having this uh, modern, like we call it, the modern water point for domestic use. Generally, the, before you come with the borehole and the pump, there were some existing traditional water points. They can be used now for uh, other uses than potable water, and the, the, the pump itself could be mainly used for uh, domestic use, for uh, uh, drinking or for uh, uh, cooking. Most of the time, even we know that for bathing or for washing cloth, they, they, they still go to the traditional water point. They don't use the, the pump itself. So, so it's not totally true to say that uh, we need to break out the idea of domestic water supply as a separate requirement. It's not Maybe that we should not say it like that way, but it's true that the modern water point can supply some specific uses and 
the existing water, the former water point can complementary can bring complementary uh, water for other uses. Back to you. Um, yes, Terry, I'm afraid that we'll have to end now um, in, in order to respect our final um, closing time of 11 a.m. So uh, for those of you that came in late or found this all a bit too much to digest in one go, let me remind you that we will have it on our website. So let me start the closing by thanking everyone. Of course, I'd like to thank all of our participants for taking time to join us and type in all of those questions and comments, especially some of those that I've noticed have been uh, joining us for all three webinars. A, a special thanks to you for your loyalty. Uh, thanks to Terry, Alex, and Tom for the substance of the webinar. And thanks to uh, Kirsten and Agnes for facilitating the question and answer period. Uh, thanks to Army and Silpi. They were our uh, tag team on technical assistance today. And finally, Thanks to Su Jung for managing the Adobe Connect for us so wonderfully today, as always. So as I just said, um, you can get the copy of the recording uh, for this webinar, as well as for previous webinars, at, if you go to our World Bank Water website. We have a special web page for the webinar. You've gotten emails from us in the past, and you'll be receiving another one uh, today or tomorrow. Just click on the Get More Information button, and that will take you to our web page. You'll get not only the recording, but also Terry's uh, PowerPoints for this. Um, next week's webinar will be on the uh, Finnish government rural program in Ethiopia, and we'll have Arto Suminen. Perhaps I should learn how to pronounce his name before next week, uh, with two bank discussants um, to to comment on his presentation. I'd like to also whoops make my slide advance. I'd like to also alert you to an e-discussion that uh, started yesterday and will be going on until May on the RWSN discussion group called D Groups. The topic is the human right to water. What does this mean in practice? And this will be a nice lead into our uh, June webinar on the human right to water. So if you need to get to that uh, discussion group, have not yet joined it, just follow the link on our web page, and um, you can register there. So thank you, everybody. I hope to see you next Tuesday and every Tuesday after that until June 6th. No, sorry, June 12th. <laughs> um, okay, bye. Goodbye until next week.